welcome back. This is the panel for the maritime security. After a live discussion about the cybersecurity, now it's time to go and discuss about maritime security. The pandemic has posed certain challenges across the industry. However, piracy and sea robbery incidents are persistent. We have hotspots, either in Singapore Strait, in Gulf of Guinea, etc., and so on and so forth. And uh, we have an, a number of experts to discuss uh, these issues surrounding maritime security. So in this panel, we're going to be joined by Philip Diacom. Philip is the <clears throat> owner slash director of Dryad Global. Mrs. Lydell Zubert, uh, who is a researcher with Stable Seas. Uh, Dan, who is the director of uh, Terra Firma Risk Management, a specialized risk management firm. We have... Uh, Dimitris Magnatis, who is the CEO of Marisk. And last but not least, we have my Mark <clears throat> Sutcliffe, who is the managing director of the well-known CSO Alliance. So I would like to welcome you all uh, into this panel. I would like to start with your uh, introductory comments slash remarks regarding uh, maritime security. And I will start with Philip. Philip. You have to unmute and I yes, press the wrong button. Good afternoon, everyone, and um, uh, hello from a dreary London, uh, UK. Uh, thank you for uh, the uh, opportunity to talk here with the rest of the panel, who are from all over the world as well. And I'm hope uh, everyone's not got too many square eyes from looking at screens all day. Um, so thank yeah, the introductory comment there is 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 bang on. You know, we are all talking about the uh, COVID epidemic. That is that is the topic. Has it affected what we are looking at here in terms of um, maritime crime, of which piracy is one component. And I think you're right to point out that they are entirely separate. And uh, from what we've seen, it, we are not able to show a correlation of increase or decrease, decrease as, a, um, as a result of any form of COVID impact. Um, the, the introductory comment I'd like to make is that, you know, whilst the IMB has released its report about um, the Southeast Asia being still continuing by volume to be the epicenter of maritime crime. Um, rightly, everyone has also picked up on the fact that the Gulf of Guinea poses the most significant threat to seafarers due to the nature of the crime, but also the complexity of the uh, situation behind it. Um, so we're talking about Southeast Asia is still a threat to seafarers, but they tend to be lower level robberies Knife crime is evident, but your, your chances of being significantly affected by that crime as on a personal level is less than say in West Africa. So West Africa is still, in as far as we are concerned, the epicenter of significant maritime crime that impacts seafarers personally, directly. And that's seen through kidnappings primarily. That ordeal is something you know that someone conducting their day-to-day -day work really should be exposed to on the level that it is in, in, in West Africa. So what I'd say is you know, what we have here on this panel is, is a group of experts who understand this realm. And we, you know, hopefully we'll be able to answer the questions that um, the audience have in terms of what we understand the situation to be and perhaps the, the way forward. Certainly we've got some experts uh, who are able to do that pretty strongly, I feel. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Lydell, you can have your presentation. You have to double click in order to initiate the presentation. Yep, we can see the presentation, yeah. Good morning um, from Denver in Colorado, the US. Uh, I'm sorry. Have you double clicked? Yes. Okay. Right. Uh, sorry, now I'm too far. Uh, this is good. Sorry about that. Um, in the first three quarters of 2020, um, the highest number, as Philip has mentioned, of incidents was in Asia. Um, we have high incidents in the Malacca Straits and Singapore and at, in Manila anchorages. Um, most of these incidents is low-level um, crime. 
Um, one incident in the Sulu Sea that was of concern this year is the kidnapping of five fishermen um, by Abu Sayyaf from a fishing boat in Ladadatu in uh, Malaysia. In September, the Philippines military found the body of one of the hostages in Patikul, Sulu in the Philippines. Uh, he seemed to be um, have been killed while trying to escape. And the remaining four are still in captivity. Um, uh, the Gulf of Guinea incidents remain high, and it's the incidents that's mostly of concern being kidnapping incidents. Um, and we saw, see the majority of kidnapping incidents uh, worldwide in this area. In Mexico, armed robbery of vessels serving the oil industry continued. Um, uh, we saw uh, vessels like offshore support vessels, accommodation barges, and pipelines um, targeted. Uh, vessels was robbed also in countries in the Americas like Brazil, Colombia, Ecuador, Haiti, and Peru. Um, incidents in the Western Indian Ocean remained low, with the most noticeable incident on robbery of the Panamanian tanker Aegean II of Barida, Somalia, in 2020. Um, in August, the last three hostages of the Raj, Shiraz held in Somalia for more than five years were released. Um, COVID had an impact on private armed security guards on vessels and specifically on our floating armories in the area. Um, many of them were stuck for prolonged times at sea on armories. Then in the Gulf of Guinea, um, with this uh, shift in concentration of incidents in this area away from, from the Niger Delta, Calabar, and um, Cameroon. Then um, pirate groups involved in kidnapping of crew moved operations further away from the Niger Delta and Cameroon as to as far off as Ghana on the south and Togo and Benin in the northwest. We also had to attack um, almost 200 nautical miles off the coast um, of Nigeria, um, in the case of the Karako trader. This was the furthest um, incident, hijacking, or kidnapping incident off the coast in the last 10 years. Um, although kidnapping incidents did not um, increase, we saw an increase in the number of crew um, taken. And the most um, effective solutions is still found, found with the ship. So armed security guards is essential in this area, and so is best management practices. But at the end, no solution will be possible that does not include Nigeria and coordinated response from the region. And this unfortunately will require trust and transparency and cooperation across stakeholders. Um, the Nigerian government's industry joint working group is a positive step. Um, when navies in the, the area, when we saw them working together, we had very good results, like in the kidnapping of the Halu Feng II, um, where, where navies from Cote d'Ivoire, Ghana, Togo, Benin, and Nigeria co cooperated to track and interdict a hijacked vessel and um, arrested 10 pirates. Um, a regional input shared information and targeted intelligence um, is, is necessary and a valid threat assessment for this area. Most pirate groups are based and launch attacks from the Niger Delta, but there's no clear picture um, of pirate networks and pirate bases in the area. And land-based intelligence is needed. Um, and a worrying... Um, thing in the area is also there's very few arrests and it's even lower than last year. Um, and pirates responsible for kidnapping of the Ambika was arrested earlier um, this year. Um, but arrest and prosecution of pirates and the disruption of pirate networks are essential. I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Lydell. Uh, let's move on to Dimitris. Yeah. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody. Hello, wherever you are, from uh, from Lagos, uh, where we're having 
all sorts of problems, as you know, not piracy related, however. We're talking about COVID-19 and the implications it has to maritime security, and very rightly so. We haven't really identified any specific connection with one to the other in regards to how many incidents we've had on the water. This on a global scale. However, as very correctly Liddell said also, the implications that the pandemic has brought to maritime security can be most probably, most commonly found in the private contracted armed security personnel deployed on the Indian Ocean. The fact that they have been blocked on the water for extended periods of time, the psychological fatigue that this has on those people. Um, further on, we saw a unique incident for the history of the private maritime security industry as we know it right now, where a guard took control of the vessel that he was protecting, had it under his um, occupation for three days in an effort to receive, demanding to receive, the money that was owed to him by the PMSC that he was working for. Now, we're not going to say names or anything like that, but it is very important to connect, in my opinion, the human factor, not just of the mariners and how they are affected by the pandemic, but also other seagoing personnel like PCAS, privately contracted armed security personnel. In the Gulf of Guinea, where incidents continue um, to, to carry on, the complexities of the crew being released in connection to the pandemic is something that is also of high interest in my opinion. Um, the last point that I would put some additional um, stress on is the fact that the high securitization of the maritime domain around the coastal waters of Nigeria has pushed all the pirate action groups to operate further offshore, whether that is off the coast of neighboring countries, where we see that any response in one country affects another, so this is uh, not a very good thing overall. But also, and uh, more to my personal concern, is the fact that pirates are now operating very deep offshore outside the EEZ of any of the coastal nations of the Gulf of Guinea. This, of course, means that they could be hunted by anybody, but certainly you would need to have advanced capabilities and capacity in order to do that. Maybe international large blue water navies can do it, but coastal, the navies of the coastal states certainly cannot. So there's a humongous um, security gap for vessels coming into the Gulf of Guinea while they're adequately, most times, protected within the exclusive economic zone of Nigeria, for example. When they sail outside that zone, they are totally open to attacks without any serious protection. So these are two parameters, one of COVID-19 and the second, the high securitization of the coastal region of the littoral states of the Gulf of Guinea and how piracy is pushed deeper offshore that I would like to, to look into. Okay, uh, thank you, Dimitris. Dan, you can have your presentation. You have to double click. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I've double clicked. So hopefully, yes, there we go. Uh, looking good. Okay. Um, what I wanted to do really was just to to uh, draw your attention, particularly to, to what we think of as a preparation gap. Um, so that's the gap between uh, the preparation um, that's needed for crew before they do, uh, particularly Gulf of Guinea passages, um, and the preparation that they, they they really get at the moment. Um, for the moment, there's there's quite a gap, quite a gap for crew in terms of the preparation they receive, and then what they are told by their families, the sort of information they're given. Uh, and then also the supervision, the leadership, and the management uh, from the uh, from from the management side. This preparation gap has really sort of come out to us, particularly from the debriefs that we do of hostages after after kidnaps in the Gulf of Guinea, Indian Ocean, etc. So we do one after every kidnap case. So we've done forty or fifty of those uh, so far, and and. Quite a lot of information has come out. 
Um, so um, I'm going to whiz through this really quickly because I don't want to take too much time on it um, so that the, 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 um, the discussion comes out. Let's go to the second point, first of all. That's ensuring that the attack emergency alarm is differentiated from any other alarms. The main point of that is that we've had a number of instances. I One, one happened last year where uh, we had a crew member who thought he had heard the fire alarm. It was actually the attack emergency alarm. But because he, he thought he'd heard the fire alarm, he um, immediately moved through uh, external routes to the muster point outside, on the outside of the vessel, straight into the welcoming arms of the pirates. Um, that, that was completely, completely unnecessary. Um, if the attack emergency alarm is sounded, then everybody, less, less those required or on the bridge or in the engine room, should go to the citadel immediately uh, using internal routes. Uh, and then owners, something that's really, really comes out to us from, I think, over the last year alone, uh, two or three um, uh, two or three cases, it's where um, owners need to make crystal clear to masters and chief engineers in particular that they too are expected to move to the Citadel. And there have been too many masters particularly being needlessly kidnapped. Um, really, their best way to protect the crew is for all the crew, including the masters, to get to the Citadel um, as soon as possible. Um, using a password to gain entry to the Citadel is something that's really useful and we think should become an SOP. Um, this unfortunate man who went to the, uh, or responded to a fire alarm uh, and was caught by the pirates, he then uh, um, did really well after that because he was taken down by the pirates to the Citadel and they told him to tell his, his uh, fellow crew inside to open the door. They had arranged a password and he deliberately gave the wrong password and was denied entry. Now he was then kidnapped for a month, but it did mean that the rest of the crew uh, were kept safe. So that sort of, that sort of SOP is, is really useful, we think. Carrying urgent medicines. So if people have um, heart medicines, blood pressure medicines, et cetera, um, then we think they should keep them with them during Gulf of Guinea passages, for instance. Um, when they're in, the cabin, in, in their cabin, the medicines should be in a bag uh, and the crew should be ready to take the bag with them. Now, the pirates might steal the medicines when, when they arrive at their location, but they won't necessarily do so. And it's worth companies uh, thinking of also of giving their crew anti-malarials uh, so that they can take them with them uh, if they are kidnapped. Um, lastly, we think that all crews should carry a laminated card showing the company's emergency telephone number. Uh, we've had a number of inst instances over the last three, four, five years where it's taken too long, sometimes three or four days, for the kidnappers to be able to get hold of the company. So they flail around trying different numbers, um, and that just simply wastes time which could have been used for a negotiation to get these people out as quickly as possible. So a laminated card uh, would be really useful. Um, lastly, um, onto the, the issue of crews um, and their families. It's, it's very much a personal decision, obviously, but we believe it's generally best uh, for all crew members to be honest and upfront with their family about the risks, which are very low, even in the Gulf of Guinea, but they are present. Uh, we believe that crew would be best to discuss with their families before they go on a passage how they would handle it if the crewman was, uh, if the crew member was 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 kidnapped. Um, this really helps the crew member, particularly if they are kidnapped. One of the worst things about being kidnapped, as any ex-hostage will tell you, is um, that you feel guilty and you feel worried uh, about how your family is doing while you're away. So if you can remove that worry, and if you can be clear that you know, as a hostage, you know what your family will be doing and that they will be okay uh, while you're in captivity, 
that really helps the hostage. It also helps the family as well. Um, last two things, uh, really important, as, as we all know, uh, that the family um, don't try to talk to the media or to negotiate themselves with the kidnappers. And if the crew can tell that, tell them that and say, no, it's not in my interest for you to be doing that, that would be really helpful. <coughs> and lastly, uh, very absolutely essential for the crew to try to convince the family uh, to trust the company and that the company will keep them informed about what's going on as much as possible. Um, but the trust in the company, it's very difficult sometimes, but it's really important. Okay, that's that, a very quick whiz through, back, back to you. Thank you very much, Dan. Uh, Mark, your thoughts? Okay, well, first of all, thank you for the invitation. I'm really looking forward to the debate with this sort of interesting panel. And as we sort of look at this, there are different, different criminal drivers in each region, but the kind of the overarching requirement is that each national government has got to have an interest and actually a strategy for its coastal responsibilities. It's as simple as that. Because if you have weak law, sea blindness, add to that certain levels of corruption, and you've really got the breeding ground and, and for this to sort of to kick off. And then if you sort of add to that a limited deterrence, you've got the accelerant for actually many of the problems we see active at, and at a level today. And in some countries, it's clearly going to get worse. Um, but I want to sort of also add, it's not all bad news. There's some really good work going on. Um, but it absolutely starts with honesty. And it's at events like this will allow us to come together from lots of different viewpoints around the world and be straight about how we all see it. And then, in our opinion, it's about building trust. It's between the seafarer and the captains. It's actually with their company security officers, through them, the shipping associations who are doing a lot of good work, and then the governments and the government's militaries. Uh, in short, we've all got to work better together. And actually then together, we can close the information gap. Um, and that will help um, move it all forward. And actually, it is doable. Uh, I'm more encouraged now than I have been for many years, even though it feels grim. So yeah, I hope it's a positive note to, to leave the opening statement on. OK, thank you. Thank you all for you know putting the landscape. Understand we have three theaters, let's say three uh, concerns. One is with East Asia. It's more or less, I'm just. I'm not saying it's more or less of, of, of crime nature. We have the Indian Ocean with the cases of the psychological impact of the, of the, of the pandemic uh, into the private contract that security personnel. And we have the, the, the most complex issue, the Gulf of Guinea. I would like to ask and start each, and debating each one of these topics, starting with um, the East Asia situation. In your view, what should be worrying us the most? What should be our key concern? Just focusing on East Asia for the time being. Uh, Philip. So East Asia is, um, it's a variety of complex, not complex issues. It's, cr it's crime that's facilitated through an enormous landmass. You can imagine that you, know, you, are, you are able to launch uh, and hide your criminal activities in such a vast uh, set of islands and, and land domain that really it's, it's, it's ripe for criminal activity in a way that um, there are a few areas in the world really where, well, Niger Delta is similar, we'll come on to that one. Um, and trying to police it accordingly uh, is exceedingly hard. So what we'd, without, without giving up on the idea, um, I'd say that what you've got is crime that happens to be on sea because that is the most uh, available transportation route to attack. If there were roads of that um, nature in, 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 instead of the seaways, you would probably see the same level of crime directed towards road traffic. Um, so do I think that... Um, a concerted effort against it would have an impact? Yes. Do I think it's significant enough for the nation states to really want to deal with because of its profile as it is? Probably not. Um, and that's just an outsider's view because the, 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 the truth of working in that part of the world is it's probably not high up on the agenda and it is low level crime. 
So do I think is a, there's a solution for it? Yes, like any crime, there's a solution for it. It's just how much resource can the nation state put into it when there are other higher priority issues? COVID, for example, could be one of those right now, although that part of the world is arguably going to be battling later down the line with the impacts of that. Um, but it's the case of, you know, what, what is your policing priority? This is a policing issue, ultimately, um, rather than a, uh, a, a military one. So um, I, I would say that for Southeast Asia, is it stable in terms of numbers? Can it be driven down? Yes, it can. Is it likely in the next few years? I would say no. If anything, the control on crime in that area, I would expect to see get more challenging due to other challenges within the countries. Um, so I, I'm not particularly optimistic for major changes there. There are obviously internal um, political issues too, but also from insurgencies at various levels that we may see having uh, an opportunity given to them in the next few months and years. Um, so uh, I, I am, whilst it's stable, I'm expecting it to stay that way with, it, with increased, I would instinctively say we would see coming in the next few months. Thank you. Uh, Leiden, your thoughts? Um, for me, still something of concern as well is that there was still um, a kidnapping of, of fishermen in the Sulu Sea um, this year. Um, in 2016, we saw kidnapping on commercial vessels as well. That the regional countries did bring under control. We find the, the kidnappings that did, do happen of Saba in a, in a smaller area but um, it is still of concern. Um, and um, with regard to, to the um, armed robbery and robbery of vessels in the, the um, Malacca and, and uh, Singapore Straits and um, of um, the Philippines and Anchorages, um, I also think it will be higher this year than last year. But the countries in the region did bring it in con under control previous years. And we did see um, successes in sh of Shittagong anchorages um, last year and Samarinda this year. Um, there was another race there. But something that countries in the region, I don't see them doing that uh, maybe it's just not obvious. The things that are stolen are, are, are often very specific, like in um, of the Philippines, it's um, safety equipment, breathing apparatus, um, and, uh, and um, equipment from lifeboats. I think they need to monitor the, the second-hand uh, um, market. You see some of these things on, um, you know, uh, advertised on the internet. Um, and where, do, where does that equipment come from that's, that's um, advertised second-hand? I think that, and in the case of, of um, a scrap iron from tug boats, uh, there should be, um, uh, countries should look into where this feeds in the second-hand market. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dimitris, your thoughts? Okay, yes. Yeah. The, the numbers are high for um, Southeast Asia, but if we look at the severity versus the volume, then we will see that the incidents that are perpetrated in Southeast uh, Asia are not that important in the greater um, picture of things. For example, you have one incident in the Gulf of Guinea that involves the kidnap for ransom of 21 crew members, for example, and that's a single incident, but it's extremely high impact. While in the Sulu Sea, for example, the Celeb Sea, the Malacca Straits, you may have 20 incidents at the same period of time. However, they're, they're usually theft. You know, as uh, Ludell says, they, they steal this thing or the other. Also in Southeast Asia, because it doesn't really affect large international seagoing vessels, the international community hears the numbers, is alarmed, but there's very little done in response because we feel that these vessels are not, uh, are not in such danger. It is more focused on local traders and many times on inside dealings, for example, a member of the crew or somebody from the ship owning or the ship management company are in cahoots with, uh, with some of the criminals, for example, and it's all a well-orchestrated uh, um, um, incident. 
But most importantly, um, in the past, we were able to offer private maritime security services in this region. However, after certain developments within the Philippines and Indonesia, not so much in Malaysia, this service was lifted. It's, it's not available anymore. So mariners are the ones responsible for their safety and security at this point. So with additional training and a bit more vigilance, I think that the numbers most probably would, would drop. But special focus on the severity versus volume. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dimitris. Uh, Dan, any your, your thoughts on the uh, Southeast Asia uh, theater? Um, yeah, no, I think I, I agree in, entirely with what everybody has said so far that the the uh, the threat and the severity and, and the scope of it uh, probably isn't going to be enough to, to make people, to make uh, governments apply the necessary resources to change it. Um, I suppose perversely, uh, I wonder whether the increasing tensions around China uh, and international, so, so the US, uh, Australia and, and others, uh, and and some of the regional the regional countries as well, whether those tensions may militarize the area to a large extent or to a, to to a greater extent than before, and have and, and actually bring down uh, some of the crime at sea. Um, I don't know, but that that might be a sort of slightly perverse result. Okay, thank you, Mark. Your thoughts? Yeah, well, on the on the good news side, you've got the International Fusion Centre, which is sort of a military command based in Singapore, uh, who we're partnered with, who are doing absolutely excellent work, and, and they are literally um, begging the Merchant Marine to report all incidents. They probably feel about seventy percent are missing, so we, we must get better at, at sharing our pay. I think um, the national governments are working together because they find these incidents embarrassing. It's not good. It's not good business for them to, to have the kind of uh, the, the kind of international kind of community and insurance community looking at them as though they can't run kind of a, a strategy in the backyard. Certainly, the private maritime security companies have deployed to the region and can offer a service if it escalates. And I think the most terrifying element of this conversation is the terrorism, because if you do get kidnapped off a much marine ship by a terrorist organisation, there is no ransom. And, and that's a huge concern for all of us. Um, and um, just we're grateful that, that they haven't developed the skills or, or the tenacity or the will, and they seem to be kind of focusing on local fishing operations to now. Sort of then really talking about the low level activity, criminal activity, it's sort of almost a no known. Um, it's almost like a churn. It gets stolen, there's a different gang, but the gangs do get broken up from time to time. There's good legal uh, structures and they go to prison. And, and obviously you, you kind of, really the focus for us is how do we stop this low level criminal activity? And that was coming back to our earlier point. You've got to invest in the communities so that they don't turn to crime because that's the lowest hanging fruit if you've got to feed your, your family. So yeah, thank you to you for the feel of where, of where we're at. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> now, next, uh, next topic. The Indian Ocean Theater. I would like to hear your thoughts of what is your key concern in what is going on in the Indian Ocean. And uh, it's, it's, it's the cruise as well with the psychological impact of, the, of this whole isolation thing. It's not only the, the armed security personnel, but what is your key concern for the time being and what do you expect over there? Philip. Thank you. I think we've got um, just going on from what Mark was just said about the the fusion centres. Um, I think the fusion centres are excellent ways, and we've got we've got international coordinated effort, and this is a theme that'll come back again. International coordinated effort that um, it has the assistance and the proper assistance of the nation states in the area. We get good information, and we get good information, and we can act on it. So there's a lot of reporting that goes on in uh, Southeast Asia. There's a lot of fidelity on what's going on. The fact that the crimes have a lower impact is beside the point when it comes to the structures in place behind it. And we'll, we'll come on to that. So the Indian Ocean, there's two things I'd like to pose for the Indian Ocean. The first one is um, Liddell showed us a picture with a heat map on it. And, and for the last few years, the Indian Ocean has been clear. To all intents and purposes, the Indian Ocean is no longer a piracy or a uh, criminal threat area. So the second one, follow-on point from that comes, is the JWC suited 
to influencing shipping in the way it is when it comes to HRAs. So is the HRA in the Indian Ocean still a viable construct and the way that impacts shipping, considering that it's been on the decline and has had very little impact on shipping from crime and, and piracy versus other parts of the world where West Africa, for example, where it is very slow to impose an increased HRA. So is that a suitable system for our, for our industry? I'll just leave that one open for now. And then really it's a case of, we have a lot of activity, legacy structures, you might say, including floating armories, um, provision of PMSCs, that sort of activity in the Indian Ocean, which has been infected by COVID, which is really a knock-on effect from the inability for crews to get on and off ships and leaving um, seafarers and PMSCs, PCAFs at sea for long periods of time, which puts businesses under stress, it puts the seafarers under stress, and we see the outcome that Demetrius has already alluded to. So we have effectively a structure, a mature structure in place that is arguably, or the question is, what is it serving? Um, and therefore, um, all that attention that is going into the Indian Ocean for good historical reasons, but is that still the case now? Because ultimately the situation I pose has moved on. The structures are still in place and they're kept in place by the legal structures brought onto shipping through the HRA, the JDLC areas and the insurance industry. It kind of hasn't moved on. Whereas in West Africa, which we'll come on to in a minute, it needs to move on and it needs to move on further. The Indian Ocean, more importantly, being the trading route of the world, had the world's attention when it was needed, and we are left with the legacy of that. The West Africa does not have the world's attention in the same way. Um, and we also had cooperation from nation states in the region too. We don't have that in West Africa. We'll come on to that. So that's really my view of the Indian Ocean. Um, it's, it's how we've been talking about the Indian Ocean for quite a while now. Um, and I'll be interested to hear other people's views on this too. Yeah, yeah, um, absolutely. Uh, Lydell. Um, I think the threat, the threat is still there in the Indian Ocean. I think it's offset by security measures. Um, there's not many ships operational in the area anymore. Um, what's of concern for me there is um, the arrest that was, was made of um, pirate, uh, pirate on pirate vessels last year, the one arrest. Um, um, two of those three pirates were, were a repeat offenders. Um, they've been caught a previous year as well and was let go. And what's of big concern for me there is very few of the pirate kingpins has been ever been arrested in the area. They moved on to other enterprises like weapon smuggling. And I think if, there's, if the situation on, the, on land um, isn't resolved and stable um, and there's no security measures on, on the sea, they will um, return. Um, that opportunity is still there. I think it's only offset because there's security on vessels and um, the, um, they would invest in it if they think there's a, there's a possibility of of it succeeding. Um, of, of great concern for me there is also the, the um, uh, uh, floating armories and uh, the position of security uh, teams on the vessels. Um, and this is compounded by COVID, but it's also a problem because of um, prices falling um, for security teams in the area. I think um, the what um, many of the teams are paid is becoming unreasonable very fast and it's it's not um, won't be be feasible financially for a long time and then we see measures dropping and um, vessels overloaded um, which I don't think is a good situation. Thank you. Uh, Dimitris? So if we look at the root causes of piracy in Somalia, they haven't been addressed. I hear what Phil is saying, um, that we haven't had incidents on the water and that maybe it is not justified for the Indian Ocean to be considered a high risk area anymore. I hear that and it's a valid concern. It, it, has, it has some merit to it. But on the other hand, we don't know what will happen if we take away the security element from the Indian Ocean. Alidel also said that naval assets in the region that are tasked with anti-piracy 
operations are very, very few. In order for them to respond to an incident, even with the shrinking of the HRA, it's going to take a long time. As we saw with the incident of the two fishing vessels that were attacked 300 nautical miles south of Mogadishu, if one of those two fishing vessels didn't have an armed security team on board, then we would be here now speaking about the rise of Somali piracy. The response from a military unit came 21 hours, 22 hours, if I'm not mistaken, later. So that's, a, that's, that's enough time to get a lot of things done. If Somali pirates are permitted to reoperate, then maybe they will move into a different model. Maybe taking a ship now is too much work. Maybe taking the crew only. We hear a lot of rumors, and recently it was even spoken by official lips here in Nigeria, that there are Somali elements that are operating together with Nigerian pirates. And would one element pass um, expertise to the other? I don't know. But this is a global village that we live in, and everybody has access to information. Somali pirates see what is happening in other parts of the world and will maybe try to mimic that. So in my opinion, we still need to maintain the HRA in the Indian Ocean. We have to pay a lot of attention as an industry from the inside as well, in order to upkeep the quality. Now we have ISO 28007, for example, we have a bunch of uh, due diligence um, um, systems in place, but you know, if we look at the, the cost and the margin for profit from each and every operation that the PMSCs do, and we look at the, at the, at the bigger numbers of the operations, then it doesn't meet each other. There's, there's really no profit. So prices are still being driven down. PCASP on the water are getting less and less money. So the quality is dropping. If you're able to make as much on land, why go to sea? And also the conditions, the living conditions on the floating armories would be a bigger concern to me than taking away security from the Indian Ocean. I think that this security environment that we have built needs to be maintained, but it needs to be given the opportunity to better itself. Now, we've also been speaking for many years about how do we, how do we keep PMSCs under check? And this is also a very big topic of discussion um, and something that, you know, after the dismantling of SAMI, there, there hasn't been any real effort in bringing in new sets of rules that everybody has to follow. And of course, this body, if there was a body like that, would have to ensure that these sets of rules, quality rules, are, are upkept throughout. So in closing my my points. Um, the root causes have not been addressed. We still need security in the Indian Ocean, but as an industry, we really have to look each other in the eyes and uh, decide that we need to do something about the quality factors. Okay, uh, thank you, Dimitris. Uh, Dan, your thoughts? Yeah, very briefly. Um, I, I agree entirely that, that um, the threat uh, has been suppressed. Um, it hasn't been removed um, at all. Um, and really the big question, it seems to me, uh, and it's, it's a question that's very much for, for, for others on the panel rather than me, I think, uh, and that's how do you provide the necessary security and do it effectively and cheaply uh, in, in the long run? Uh, and it's getting more and more difficult to do that. Um, I do just want to throw one other thing into this, um, and, and Philip, I think, would probably uh, be be uh, be best place to speak on this. A question about Mozambique and the uh, Islamic State, Central Africa province, and and the um, the activity around Cabo Delgado. Does that uh, uh, is is that going to affect the maritime security in the Indian Ocean? Do you think? Would you like to answer? I oh, wasn't going to step out of turn. <laughs> okay, um, so the uh, we put it into a, uh, a nation state issue, which it is, and its influence out onto the water. Uh, the question always becomes, 
how do you enforce that? Because is the nation state going to control its waters and its approach lanes? Um, when we're talking specifically in the, in, the, in the maritime domain rather than the on land. And if it's not capable of doing that, will it allow private contractors to do it? So there is a very big question about how does, this, how does that threat and the activity in Mozambique extend out onto the water? It's a large development. It's going to require a large amount of shipping in and out. So in the long term, you know, if the threat from the land moves onto the water, which arguably it can and will, but the intent, bearing in mind the agitators, what their intent is, isn't the same as piratic activity for uh, financial gain necessarily. And we could expect, going back to the terrorism um, issue, you probably don't want to end up in kidnap situations with that particular group. So they are a different threat in, in, in the sense of um, maritime operators. How you, how you deal with it? Well, it comes back to the same old issue of territorial waters and what you do beyond it and who's, who's responsible for it. And do you have the cooperation of the state inbound to it? Um, it's an unknown and it's a really valid question because it's obviously a growing issue right now. Um, there is no answer, clear answer to that one yet. What do you think, Philip? Um, Mark, your thoughts? Yeah, I think you've got to look at what were the pirates. Um, and it costs about $50,000 to launch a piracy action group to sea. Traditionally, you could put a team together in about two days and it's an intelligence-led operation. So you do not kid yourself one second. They're just sailing out into the Indian Ocean. They are incredibly sophisticated. We've even um, had evidence that they've actually bugged shipping companies to, to actually get proper insights into what's going on. So we've um, we partnered with EU, EU NAB4. We've run loads of webinars. So I can tell you the three deterrents, uh, in their opinion, is first of all, the naval presence which is physical, and they're actually engaging in Somalia. They're going in, they're talking to the, to the locals and really projecting power, saying, look, think of something else. BMP4, which is self-help by the, by the, uh, by the Merchant Marine, which um, I'm not sure how religiously it is being followed. And of course, I think credit to, to the private maritime security contractors. Um, but I think, where have these people gone? Well, they've actually gone to drugs, weapon smuggling, people smuggling, charcoal smuggling. All of these are really good revenue streams. And I'm sorry to say that is actually funding terrorism. So I don't think the problem's gone away. It's just mutating. It'll come back in, in a different form. And I think talking about threats, Iran has really been the sort of, kind of the elephant in the room for, for everyone and a huge focus. Uh, the bombings in the anchorages of Fajara, which had a massive uh, impact on, on, on sort of seafarer morale, and why wouldn't it? Terrifying uh, when you listen to the seafarers talk about the effect of an explosion on those tankers. And the remote control IED craft that they're deploying um, in the Yemen proxy war. So that, in our humble opinion, and I'm not an expert, uh, but we've got naval intelligence experts in our company, but that is terrorism where I'm coming from. Um, and I really agree with what Demetrius is saying about the, the PMSCs. I think they're tired, uh, exhausted in some case, they're not properly fed, they're not fit, they're not properly trained. And you've got to think back, six years ago we had really professional raw marines absolutely on their game. And now I can tell you there are forged documents, um, it's, they're, they're not even trained on the weapons systems that they're, they're taking out of the armory which as an ex-military man is, is close to a religious experience before they let you anywhere near a weapon. And I was an officer, crikey. So I think we've got to be very careful in the merchant marine. The very service that we're employing to protect us is, is weakened. And again, debates like this, listening to everyone, we have to be honest about what's really going on. But there are two ships we've got evidence have been delayed because the PMSCs have not been paid and, and were, were unwilling to leave until payment was made. So let's not kill ourselves, this is not a problem. And I think part of the problem, uh, and I'm sorry to say it, is although some ship owners absolutely do care, do ship owners really care? Um, and that's a massive problem for us to, to, to sort of, to maybe to take, talk about another time. Because once the ship owners have bought the insurance, they kind of tick the box and it, then everything else is an expense. And we talked to enough company security officers who know it's very tough to get the budget. It's tough to, keep the interest. And then, and that's even before you've talked to the charterer to, to ask for some, some uh, money to, to, to pay for, for all of this. On, on top of that, you, we've been through one of the worst sort of shipping recessions known to man. So 
Um, and, and I think on to, to, to wrap it all up, we reckon there's probably 25% of the reporting is not coming through as well. Uh, we've had evidence of, of incidents not being reported because we don't have problems in our company. So yeah, there's a couple of thoughts there just to, 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 to let you know that I agree with you. It's, it's not over, they're just doing different things and they'll come back if the opportunity presents itself in our humble opinion. Okay, if you would like to comment. Yeah, I was just picking up on the point of, um, of uh, the notion of terrorism in Iran. Um, th that has been the focus in terms of threat to shipping in the in wider Indian Ocean area, without a doubt, over the last two years. Now, the, 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 the good side of that is that you've got a, a rational operator that, it, that has a coherent end game from which they're playing. Now, it doesn't seem necessarily that way to um, those of us who have a different understanding of the world, but there is a rational set of decisions and a rational set of actions that follow out from that. And of course, there's an interplay between the wider geopolitics in the area with Yemen, with Saudi Arabia, with, you know, going up the further up the Persian Gulf. So, you know, those, those are in, in many ways better and more easily understood. And the threat profile is better understood in terms of who is likely to be affected. Um, going back to, you know, the, the crime that's in the area as well, of course, criminal activity will follow the money and the effort. So, in any environment, you know, if, you, if it becomes more permissive, of course, there'll be a, 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 a change in direction and a change in, in operations, maybe back to piracy. What was really interesting there for Mark was that, you know, talking about the money to get an operation going. So this is not just something thrown together, just like in West Africa, to go deep offshore, this is a planned event. This is, this is organized crime. The days of someone setting out in a small speedboat to go and have a go and dying in the process is, you know, that, that is gone because who would want to do that? Serious organized crime is only tackled by coordinated international and national activity to, to suppress it. So it comes back to nation states again. Yeah, uh, Dan, you would like to comment? Um, yeah, thanks. Um, it was really about something that, that Mark said, which, which I think is, is absolutely right uh, and not, not always the easiest thing to say, but um, when he was talking about ship owners uh, technical managers, charterers, etc. Do they do they really care enough? Um, and you know, my God, what a difficult uh, world they're trying to trying to work in at the moment. All the all the commercial pressures, the operational, the compliance, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, it's really difficult. But I think um, something else, another pressure that will come on them more and more is the the duty of care side. Um, and I just want to sort of bring attention to, to a case which I think really would be very easy to imagine in the maritime sector. That was uh, of a company called Bonatti, uh, an Italian engineering company, uh, that had a couple of its uh, directors given jail sentences, uh, essentially for negligence um, over the kidnap of, of its employees in, in 2015, I think it was. Um, and that, that was really centred around not looking after their employees properly, given the kidnap and, and other risks that, that, that were going on there. Um, and I think that, that yeah, ship owners, etc., if we go back to this preparation gap, um, they will be forced over time to take this rather more seriously than some of them are at the moment. Okay. Would anyone else from the panel would like to comment in any way regarding the Indian Ocean uh, theater? No. Okay. Now let's move on to the hottest, I would say, of these theaters, the Gulf of Gini uh, theater. Now I would like to ask in your in your in your view, what should be our key concerns and what should be on the on the top of the discussion, top of the agenda for the time being, in order to move forward starting with Philip. So I, I think uh, one of the things we're seeing is uh, the starting of a coalescing of effort, but it's taking so much time to get the attention that the area deserves when it comes to the high impact incidents that we are seeing. The number of kidnappings and the following consequences and the commercial impact of all this uh, is not lost on those whom it affects. What we are lacking in the region is the, uh, the eyes of the world and the pressure to do something about it. And that pressure translating onto this, the nation states that are responsible ultimately 
for sorting out their permissive environments. We've got multiple challenges there. We are talking about a country like Nigeria that has systemic issues with fraud and corruption. And there are a lot of competing agendas that mean that ultimately a lot of people do not benefit from tackling this problem. And we in the industry are perhaps slow to put on the true pressures that we know need to occur. And that's because we don't, you know, West Africa is not the Indian Ocean. It isn't the major trading lane of the world. Um, so more noise needs to uh, be made from the industry to coalesce the pressure. Now, going exactly back to what Mark said, we have got uh, probably shipping, I would only compare to the construction industry when it comes to who holds, who holds the risk and the subcontracting nature or the, um, the interested parties in one vessel, for example. It is so diverse and, and uh, when it comes to, you know, do they really care? Well, that risk is perceived to be held by someone else so often that it's hard to pin down how you're going to articulate this and put that pressure on as a collective. Um, is it the charter? Is it the operator? Is it the owner? Who's going to hold this risk ultimately reputationally? Because that's a massive one. But then also, um, we're talking with Dan's area of the world, there is a, a definite and a finite financial implication to commercial operators. How that is then seen as being a threat to commercials is again a little bit opaque because it's not talked about. So how do we bring about that, that pressure? Because I would say, you know, as an industry, we do need to make more of a noise about those nations that are responsible for policing their own issue, their own areas. That's how I'd start that discussion um, because we are not gonna see a capable EU NAV4 type interference in the area because ultimately it's not uh, set up that way. We're not going to get the cooperation of the nation states and uh, the sea lanes aren't the same. It's a lot of activity within uh, EEZs, within um, coastal waters. We, Demetrius mentioned about being pushed out absolutely right. Over the last three years, we've seen activity pushed outside the economic zones because that's where they can operate with impunity. But are we going to see a blue water fleet uh, attacking that? I don't think so. I, I cannot see it happening. There isn't enough emphasis from the outside world to make that happen. So who's, who's left carrying the can? It's the industry as a whole. Then we come back to who's the industry? Because uh, again, Mark knows this all too well, trying to get together a, 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 a consensus for opinion that holds weight within our owners, operators, charterers is exceedingly difficult. I don't have the answer for that one, but I'm sure some of the panel can come up with some uh, uh, views on that. Thank you, Philip. Uh, Lydell, your thoughts? I think um, this whole issue in the Gulf of Guinea um, is at the end connected to the land, and that is what's going on in the Niger Delta. I mean, majority of people very poor. Um, the root of this is economic. Um, uh, their um, pollution, the areas is polluted by oil bunkering, um, and the oil activity um, in the area. Corruption is, is a, a problem. Um, so there's so many uh, problems in the Delta that need to be addressed and it's a very complex uh, problem. Um, at the end, um, with regard to, to kidnapping, um, pirate groups operating from the Delta is destabilizing the whole area. That's why I think no solution without Nigeria would be possible um, at all. Um, and we see different patterns in the, in the area and different um, um, things going on. Um, we find, find incidents on, on visiting commercial vessels, but we also see incidents on locally operated um, vessels. And it's about um, half, half of the incidents is on each. The local operating vessels is often the, those that's not incidents that's not reported. And they constantly have to operate in, in that um, uh, area, which makes it um, more difficult. Uh, we don't see a lot of hijackings now, but while we see um, often kidnapping associated with Nigeria, we get some other nations involved when these hijacking um, incidents. Um, for for um, 
where we did get, get um, countries in the region, naval forces working together, and especially when there was exercises going on with uh, foreign, foreign Navy as, um, assets, it was very successful. Last year, when, when um, a Spanish vessel was there, it led, led to arrest and disruption. So I don't think necessarily we need um, a constant Navy presence there from foreign navies, but it would help if there's exercises from time to time um, in the area where these um, assets can support um, uh, local navies. Because um, measures in Niger Nigeria is pushing the incidents out into other countries, territorial and um, waters and EEZs, and um, they don't have the capacity to deal with this always. Um, but they can be successful, and there's, there's proof of this in the past. Um, and I think we need to have a look at long term term um, measures and maybe short term ones, what we can do in the short term uh, um, to address this. But things are more difficult when Somalia, EU NAFOR could send helicopters, you know, over pirate territory and see when launches occur. The terrain is much different in, in um, the Gulf of Guinea. Um, it's very hard to see um, what's going on in the, on, on ground level, even with helicopters. Um, it's a much more difficult environment. Thank you. Thank you, Ladel. Uh, Dimitris, your thoughts? Well, <clears throat> as a solution for the Gulf of Guinea, you know, if we look at the short term solution, then I think that the privatization of the maritime security, the private maritime security environment in Nigeria has helped to a very large extent, not only through the static um, operations, by static we mean uh, armed security escort vessels protecting pipes and offshore installations, for example, uh, pipelines and all that, but the escorts of international vessels or local vessels, vessels trading locally, has generated very decent results. Vessels that have come under attack have been spared because of the security response that was immediate and present. However, again, I am going to mention the lack of quality by very many players who are operating within Nigeria and selling services to international clients that don't, don't necessarily understand the operating environment of Nigeria or what that security service is uh, supposed to entail. We hear a lot about compliance, and that is also a very big issue. There are companies and providers that provide maritime security services in Nigeria that are above and beyond any compliance level, and very many others that are beyond. Who keeps them in check? This is a good question. Recently, we've seen a crackdown or a clampdown from the um, authorities here in Nigeria against companies that operate in a gray area of legality within Nigeria. So the due diligence package of a company that is able to provide security services in a compliant matter is a humongous issue and one that is very many times overlooked because of lack of education or understanding by the clients. So the, the piracy problem in the Gulf of Guinea is not gonna go anywhere. It's gonna be here. As we have said throughout this conversation, piracy is a land-based problem, and it, it is more evident here in Nigeria than anywhere else, I think. If you don't have an operating base on land, you're not able to, um, to do acts of piracy on the water. Piracy can only be interdicted on the water. If we want to deal with it, end it, or try to end it, we have to look at the land. The inequalities in the countries of West Africa, the lack of opportunity, the lack of employment, the general sense of, um, of, of disapproval by the local populace in connection to the oil and gas industry, for example, is what generates more and more consensus or even support for piracy. 
not, of course, spoken out openly, but we see that on many levels, it is considered like a time-honored tradition. So I think that through education, through investment on land, further securitization, of course, of the maritime domain, and not only in Nigeria, because in Nigeria, it has been highly securitized to a certain extent. We also need to focus on the other countries, Benin, Togo, for example, Equatorial Guinea, Gabon, Cameroon. Cameroon is dealing with the problem very well, of course, but it's just the expansion of the phenomenon depending on the actual pressure points. You have one pressure point that you deal with, the problem is going to manifest itself in another place. So there needs to be a regional strategy, not simply based on the Yaounda code and in a concept of uh, um, of positive cooperation in words or even in documents, but actual, there needs to be a lot of investment in order for the navies, the government security forces and the private sector combined to be able to suppress maritime criminality in the Gulf of Guinea further. But the takeaway from what I've just said is that piracy is a land-based problem. And if we really wanna deal with it, we need to look at it on land. Okay, thank you, Dimitris. Uh, Dan, your thoughts? Um, yeah, I think I've probably got two things to say, one, one, one negative and, and one slightly positive. Um, the negative side is, um, I'm taking what everybody has said so far, um, you know, this, although there are some signs of improvement in some ways, they're very slow, and this, it's a real mess in the Gulf of Guinea. And it, it reminds me very much of, um, of an age-old dichotomy where the nation states involved, and particularly Nigeria, um, tend to focus on uh, side issues. So they tend to look at how, how ship owners are um, providing ransoms within their, within their territory, rather than, than, than looking at the security problems and trying to do something about them. Um, and removing the political security grievances uh, which are behind all of this. So it's very like Colombia in the 1990s um, or, or the early thousands in, in that way. It's very reminiscent. Um, so that's, that's a negative side. The positive side, though, um, is that, and it's, it's, it's only a bit positive, um, but something I've been surprised at, I, I think the first the first uh, Gulf of Guinea case I did was in 2008, probably. So it's been quite a while now. Um, but I, what I've been surprised at is how the capacity of the kidnappers, the pirates, really hasn't uh, moved massively. And given given the, the sort of target richness around that area. Um, in terms of actual targets that are in front of them and the money that's in front of them, um, then really uh, all they have done is increase their ability to take more hostages at one time. So whereas they were taking one, two or three people at the start, now they've, they've taken you know, 9, 10, 11, 12 people all, all in one go. But what hasn't changed, as far as I'm aware anyway, um, is the size of the ransoms in particular, in particular. So compare that to the Indian Ocean, where size of ransoms went up, particularly after governments became, became involved in it. Um, it was just, just a quite extraordinary um, increase in, in ransoms taken. Um, and that hasn't happened in the Gulf of Guinea, as far as I'm aware. Um, and um, they're not actually, I, I had thought there were signs, say, four or five years ago, that some kidnap gangs were contemplating building bigger accommodation and better facilities in order to hold more people and to maximize their, their take uh, by being able to hold them longer. And that, yes, they take more people at a time, but there doesn't seem, as far as I understand anyway, to be a massive, size, massive uh, increase in infrastructure. So there's something that is, that is stopping uh, for the moment anyway, um, this is becoming a bigger industry. And I take some comfort out of that anyway. Thank you, Dan. Uh, Mark, your thoughts? Yeah, 
Um, I'm going to sort of talk about this in two ways. First of all, the information, and then what do you actually do with the information you get? If you ask anyone in the Indian Ocean what they think the single trigger to success was in us combating the uh, Somali piracy threat, it was actually Mercury. And that was a military communications platform that enabled all of the stakeholders in real time to have all of the information at their fingertips. And that also included the International Maritime Bureau. They've got two guys full time in Kuala Lumpur, and they would always send an immediate report out 50 nautical miles from any incident they get. So Mercury worked in the Indian Ocean. Just hold that thought. I think what we're facing here is a sort of information gap. And what we're looking for is ferry operators who are operating in the Bonnie River, the indigenous bunker and tanker owners to feel really involved in this process, feel they've got a trusted area to report to, because that's the information we can kind of share with, with Philip's team and Demetrius' team and actually see what really is going on. And also bear in mind the oil companies and all of their supply craft, um, there are about 150 fully approved offshore supply craft working today in the Indian Ocean, then a sort of second tier and a third tier of quality. These are, this should be, because all of this information in real time helps. And that's really where we come in because at least we can offer an anonymous place to to report. Um, and we've got to make it safe to report. A whole load of reasons why people don't, but we, we understand the dynamic and we're working with people to, to try and drive that forward. But getting the information is key. The second point is what do we do with the information that we get? Um, we've got, again, evidence that in some commands, after six o'clock, the information stops because they don't want to disturb the one star, wake him up or disturb his dinner. So, and you bear in mind, we're working in a region where there's a weak rule of law, there's seed line governments, um, with internal issues, there's corruption, there's coastal poverty, and there's disenfranchisement. There's a whole load of, a plethora of issues that the national government is, is facing. With. So really the key thing for us is to see each government has got to get its own act together. They've got to really get a grip. And I think here's the good news. Uh, you, if, you, if you read about the Deep Blue project in Nigeria, literally all the kit, kits there. I think the two air, last two aircraft are arriving this week. And there's a real willingness about the Nigerian um, government and militaries to, to really get a grip. Um, so I, I, I'm not saying it's all over, but that would really help the region because 80% of the problems are actually in Nigeria. Um, so the UN Code of Conduct, it is important. It does give a framework. It gives the international kind of regional coordination center and, and the maritime operation centers and the EU through the SWAGS project are putting in millions, many millions of pounds worth of kit and training. So things are going on. And I think really what we do with the, once we've got the information, we've got to develop a better two-way relationship between our captains and crews, the CSOs, the shipping associations, these regional reporting centers, deep blue, um, the governments, the militaries, it's, it's, it's a team effort because actually I think that was a large part of the success in the Indian Ocean uh, and it's just good old fashioned getting a grip, focusing and talking. And, and I think Demetrius, you made a very interesting point. A lot of the CSO's anxiety is about who to buy the securities from, um, how much to pay for it. And, and it's a very, very, uh, not, no time to go into it now, but it's a very, very murky area and we'd be delighted to sort of go around the boy again vis a the SAMI model, because you know, we're great supporters of that. Um, so there is, there might be something in that, um, because I think the private maritime security uh, model uh, needs probably help, needs looking at, and um, we're, we're happy to, to help with, with our insights, with all humility. We don't have the answers, but we can definitely connect the right people and share experiences and something might come of it. So the, the door's open there, if, if you want. Okay, yes, uh, Philip, yes. Uh, I'd just like to add on to what Demetrius and Mark just said. There is nothing more curative than the, the, the bright, shining light of sunlight onto a subject. And um, what the PMSC world or the private security world has suffered from, really through probably commercial objectives, is um, lack of transparency and clarity. And this comes from what's the overarching governance that goes with it? Well, there isn't really one. You know, there, so therefore, the operators, the CSOs, I absolutely understand their problem. There's a fear of, am I doing the right thing? Um, am I being ripped off? Am I gonna get caught out? 
You know, that, that is the individual's challenge. The other side of the challenge is what can I do right now about the problem? Because what we're talking about are long-term systemic challenges that can be and will be addressed, but they are not the operator's concern right now. The operator's concern is what do I do today about the problem? And um, Liddell, you mentioned about, you know, essential to have guards in the, uh, in, in, or some form of escort rather, armed escort in, in the Gulf of Guinea. I would say that, you know, be selective about that, but on top of it, physical security. So B, you know, BNP West Africa is a, a good starting point without a doubt, but physical security on your vessel, hardening, proper effective hardening is another one. You know, is it talked about properly? Probably not. It's still a bit, um, there's a lot of vessels we know of that operate, you know, with extremely low freeboards at extremely low speeds, close into threat, threat areas who do nothing. So there's a, there's a message to send out to the industry and there is light to shine on this industry and communicate in an open way to uh, all of us. And you know, that's something that we've been um, running for some time now and will continue to do so. And I absolutely echo what Demetrius is saying because there are those who do it well and there are those who don't. Let those who do it well bubble to the top and be selected by those who are making the decisions with confidence. And that confidence only comes from education. And you know, that's where it, um, Mark and the CSO Alliance spreading the word, but in a more public way, because I think the public part of this is the challenge. There's a lot of secretive um, discussion going on. There's this, there's this desire not to be caught out, this desire to somehow not stand, put your head above the parapet. And that comes back to this commercial imperative again. So um, it's easy to say when you're not in that decision bubble, but when you're standing above it, which we have the luxury of, but you know, shining the light on the subject is, is the starting point for this. Okay. Is there anyone else from the panel who would like to comment on this before we move on to our last question for the panel? Okay. Now, my last question for the panel, I want you to, to stay, let's say, in, within, let's say, a, a two-minute range, each one of you. Um, what have we learned out of this experience we had over the last, let's say, the last year? What have we learned as an industry and how can we move forward into a more uh, security resilient industry? What should be the key priority? What should be the top of our agenda? Just give us your thoughts in let's say less than two minutes each in order to, to conclude the panel. Uh, let me have your thoughts. How we move forward to a more security resilient industry? Philip. Uh, I think it comes down to just two points really. One is that um, anything of quality comes with a cost. And you cannot rely on the market to provide quality if it's not regulated. And I'm talking about the wider security market. If it's not regulated across the board, you will end up with secure with um, quality issues. And you will inevitably pay a low price for a low product. There is a balance here, obviously. You've got to have market competition to provide a, a valuable service in a competitive environment. But what we're seeing or have seen is the downside of a, of a lack of demand for quality and an open market. And the other thing is be aware, be open to informing yourself about the, the security environment. Don't just follow your due diligence tick list. Don't just do what everyone else has done before you without really understanding why you're doing it and have an open mind to, you know, do you need something? Should I be doing more? How do I inform myself? And I think that's probably what we've learned through um, certainly in the Indian Ocean, and we're seeing more and more in the West uh, West Africa. Thank you, Philip. Leiden? Um, I agree with Philip about the, the cost and quality. I think the shipping industry must take into account that, uh, you know, good security measures will cost them some money. Um, otherwise, we end up with security that's not well trade and below um, standard. Um, I also think we should learn, um, um, take the lessons learned in the Indian Ocean and and um, uh, um, apply some of that in in the um, Gulf of Guinea. A good point Mark made is a mercury, mercury um, type of of uh, system. I think would also so be a, a good idea in that area. And I think we have to address long-term term, term um, 
problems in the Gulf of Guinea um, and, and, create, and find um, solutions, but we also need to, to look at um, solution that will immediately or in the short term um, have an effect. This, this situation is cyclical. Um, it's been going on for decades, and um, from where I sit there, um, is not much improvement in the, in the you know attacks and uh, the security of of seafarers in the area. So I think we should address both, and I think cooperation between between countries in the the. Um, Gulf of Guinea is essential, and no solution will be possible with, without Nigeria. Thank you. Uh, Limitis. So if, if we understand security being, um, being free from fear, I think that in order for this industry to show resilience, there needs to be two elements. Everybody seems to be focusing on two things. I will also focus on two things, but different ones. The one is empathy. I, I strongly believe that the decision makers, whomever they are, whether they are in government or in a specific company or whomever they are, needs to show empathy for the people that are called to do their job on the water and they are doing it under a, a state of fear because of the insecurity that is prevalent around them. So I think one thing is empathy. We all need to show empathy so that this, this, this operating environment becomes less toxic. However, that doesn't provide a solution. It provides, though, a better understanding of what is happening and what needs to be done. And the second element, I think, is education. Now, not in the grand sense of education, but very specific. We touched a little bit upon the fact that each security company will tell its clients that the right way to do things is the way that they do it. But do they say that because they really believe that? Or do they say that because it's the only way that they can operate and sell a product? So I think that education in a wider sense is something that will help this industry very much, both educating the security actors and the end user, the clients. Uh, thank you, Dimitri. Thank you. Uh, Dan, your thoughts? Um, I think what I'll do really is, is to, to take up Demetrius's theme of, of, of empathy. Um, and I, I, my, my, uh, uh, the most important message, message from me, I think, is that the ship owners, the charterers, the operator, operators, um, it's another plea to them to put uh, the crew um, and the officers very much at the centre of what they're doing amongst all the other difficulties that, that they have. And I, I don't underestimate those at all. Um, but it's to, to, um, to really address this preparation gap, uh, to give them the effective quality security that uh, you, you've been talking about, the other panelists, um, and to prepare them properly and to let them give them the, the confidence and the education and the knowledge to prepare their families too. Um, and I think uh, that of the kidnaps that we've seen, say in the last two years, something like a quarter of them uh, would probably have been preventable had there been decent preparation, which is quite a high amount really. That, that's it from me. Thank you very much, uh, Dan. Uh, Mark, your thoughts? Yeah, I, th I think I'm with, we've, we've said it a few times, all of the crime that we face as an industry is coming from, from the land. So really part of where we're focusing is we're really working on ports and shipping, working so much more effectively together, because it's not just the sort of physical crime, be it stowaways, drugs, uh, but it's also, and, and this is probably the first event where we've never mentioned the word cyber, but it's also the evolving cyber threat as well. We've got to be more effectively working together about a common threat, which destroys the whole supply chain. And we are, let's not forget, carrying 90% of the world's goods by sea. So I think, you know, just what I'm, you know, what listening to you guys for the last 90 minutes, Philip's been talking about the transparency on issues. You're, you're really absolutely right. It's uncomfortable. 
um, but I think it can be done. And I think people are, are, are sort of broadening their shoulders, stiffening the spine and taking the heat. And actually we're beginning to see that in Nigeria. You, you listen to the new director general of NAMASA, uh, very, very impressive man. And, 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 and that bodes well, you know, cut half full on that score. I think, um, Dan, the preparation gap, I've never heard that before until today. So I'm learning something new. And you're right, preparation prevents um, poor performance, and these are people's lives, so that does need focus. Um, I think Demetrius shining a light on the security provision, certainly in West Africa, is an imperative. Um, it needs to be done, it kind of needs to be done now, I'm very happy to, to have a, another conversation. And I think where would it be with, without the academics? You know, it's absolutely essential that you're tracking um, the, the, the work and what we're doing and, and giving good interpretation. So actually, I think what I've, you know, to answer your question, um, what I've learned in the last hour, we've got a good team here, plucked out of nowhere. I think give us another hour and we would probably move it forward even further. So, um, but I, I kind of leave you with what motivates us. All our crew must be allowed to go to work all day, every day, safe and secure. We do, and they should. Uh, and we call it security through community, and that's what motivates us. And, and I've, I've really enjoyed the um, session. So, uh, with all humility, thanks for inviting us. And I've learned a great deal and enjoyed it. So, thank you. Mark, thank you very much. You stole my closing comments. Uh, I would like to thank you for the recap. I would like to say this is one of the most uh, well rounded, informative, and thought provoking sessions I've ever seen. I've ever seen, and I've seen a lot. One of the very few I've shared over the last years. I promise you, I will be back because I what what the the, the full the full concept of what I heard and the rapid and informative uh, approach. Uh, I liked it a lot, and we'll be back. I will get back to you because we want to 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 arrange for a series of um, uh, of feedbacks, especially for the magazine and of course for the portal. Um, but I would like to thank you all uh, for participating in this panel. It's been an honor and a privilege for us. I, I'm sure that the viewers would love it. The recording will be there, of course, for those who, who missed it. I would like to thank you all very much once again. And um, <clears throat> I'd like to ask our viewers to stay online. We'll be back in half an hour with the, the last panel of this today event. Thank you all very much. Thank you.